you're listening to me speak for the first time, um, in 2006, I was actually supposed to die. It was supposed to be the last day of my life. The doctors had told my family that these are my final hours. I was in a coma, a deep coma, which was a result of having stage four lymphoma. The lymphoma had spread throughout my body, so I had tumors, some of them the size of lemons, um, all spread from the base of my skull around my neck and in my chest and all the way down to my abdomen. And my organs had started shutting down and my lungs were filled with fluid and I was connected to piped oxygen. And, um, and while I was in the deep coma, it appeared to everyone around me that my body was limp and lifeless, but I was actually feeling amazing and no longer in my body. I was on the outside of my body and I felt incredible. I felt incredible. Now I've shared my story in many different outlets and today I just wanted to give you a shorter version of it because I actually wanted to speak more about the after effects and the lessons I learned. So anyway, when I was in the coma, I realized that the real me is not the physical body because I continued to exist even though I was in a coma and I was existing outside of my body and I felt amazing and I felt powerful and free. But the one thing that stood out most was that I felt as though I was encompassed or enveloped in this feeling of unconditional love. And it was a kind of love that I've never felt in this life before. Um, I went on to a point where I was given a choice as to whether to return or not. And I actually write about this in great detail in my book, Dying to Be Me. Um, but when I reached the point where I was given the choice as to whether to return or not, at first I didn't want to come back. I didn't want to return because it was so beautiful on that side. My body was dying and um, I had been suffering. My family had been suffering because I was dying. So no part of me wanted to come back. But my, my dad, who I met in the other realm, he was encouraging me to go back. And he said that now that you know the truth of who you really are, your body will heal. And this is the part I want to talk about when he said, now that you know the truth of who you really are, your body will heal. So when I did come out of the coma, <clears throat> I was in the coma for about 30 hours, which is not even two days. Um, I came out of the coma and literally within four days, my tumors shrunk by 70%. The doctors couldn't believe it. They didn't even know what to write in my medical records. Within five weeks, I was completely cancer free. I was still frail and I had to build up my strength but I was completely cancer free and left to go home to live my life cancer free. Um, now here's where the challenge started and this is what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about. I understood that the cancer was because of a lifetime of choices and decisions that I had made. And it was, I realized that the cancer was because I had never ever allowed myself to be who I am from the time, from the time I was very, very young. Um, many people say to me, the cancer nearly killed you. And I say, no, the cancer saved my life. Our bodies are very smart and our bodies are always trying to communicate with us. So I, I always say that I was killing myself even before I had cancer. The cancer was my body trying to communicate with me and it was trying to save my life. I spent a lifetime of making myself small, of being a doormat, of, um, of giving and giving of myself, of putting myself last, of dimming my own light, of never expressing myself. In fact, of being invisible and, in, and very often even apologizing for my own existence for my own existence. And I'd spent a lifetime of this before I even got cancer. And when I was in the other realm, I realized 
that the reason we come here is to shine our light and to be who we are and to be all that we can be. I had grown up in a culture where there's a lot of gender disparity, where women and men are treated very differently. And women are rewarded for playing small. In fact, if you express yourself, if you be all that you can be, it's not considered a good thing. You're considered to be a woman who has a mind of her own and too strong. And you get judged. You get judged by the other people in your culture. You get judged by society. And that was the kind of um, environment that I grew up in. Having now been on the other side and knowing that we come here to shine our light, I knew that I had to shine my light now that I was back in my physical body. And I knew I couldn't go back to being the person I used to be because the person I used to be was the person who got cancer. But here's the thing, when you've had a radical change, a radical shift like that, and you can't go back to being the person you used to be, how do you go back into the environment where you were before? How do you fit back in? That was where the struggle began for me. And in fact, I speak about it in a lot more detail in the book, What If This Is Heaven? I speak more about all the things that happened after and how I had to integrate back into life again. So if you imagine, for example, um, someone who struggled with addiction and then they go for rehabilitation and after being rehabilitated, their fear then is to go back to the environment where they where they actually manifested the addiction in the first place. So it felt as though I had two choices when I went back to my old environment. It felt as though either I had to risk losing my old friends or disappointing my old friends because I really had to be this person who I realized I truly was. I had to discover who I really am. And I was afraid my old friends, my old community, my old society may not like me or accept me anymore. So either I had to do that and take that risk, or I had to go back to be the person I used to be. And I knew that wasn't a choice because the person I used to be was the person who got cancer. And I couldn't do that. Thankfully, I have a husband who is extremely supportive. And so we ended up moving to a completely new area, a new village, a new town um, in a new home. And we lived amongst people who didn't know me. They didn't know who I was before. And this was very liberating. It was very freeing because I was now able to completely explore freely who I am now, who I am as a result of this near-death experience as a result of discovering that I'm supposed to express myself. I'm not supposed to repress myself. I'm not supposed to make myself small. I'm not supposed to be a doormat. I used to be a people pleaser. Um, so I realized the best thing I can do is shine my light bright. And so now I was able to do that safely in an environment where nobody knew the person I was before. And so, I was able to truly explore and get to know this new me. And it was really an amazing journey and something that I highly, it's something I highly recommend that you try, that you take yourself into an environment when nobody knows you and you totally rediscover who you are right now without all the baggage that you were in the past. This means that at any point in time, we can choose to die to who we were in our past. So even though in the book, Dying to Be Me, I speak about the day that I actually died and going forward from there, what subsequently happened, um, any of us can choose to die to our past at any time if we actually choose to do that. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful journey and really I do highly recommend it. What I discovered over the years was that I felt a lot freer. I felt a lot more expansive and open and it allowed me to not worry about what people thought of me. When I was in my old environment before we moved, 
I always felt that I had the choice of either um, being who I am and disappointing people or pleasing people but suppressing who I am. Those were like the two choices. But that feeling dissipated once I moved to a new environment when nobody knew me. And, um, and it can be so freeing to really start to discover and get to know who you are truly get to know. And when you start to get to know who you are, you, I, what I did was I started to make a commitment to myself that I'm not going to judge myself. Whatever transpires, whatever comes out, I'm going to let it. I had the advantage of having been in that near-death experience where I discovered that I, in fact, all of us are, we are all actually amazing, beautiful, powerful spiritual beings. Every single one of us, we're all beautiful, powerful, spiritual beings. We are all pure essence. We are all pure love. And I realized that all these other things, all these other things like fears and insecurities, <clears throat> excuse me, all of these are an accumulation from here. They're not something that we have in the other realm when we die. They're not part of our pure essence. They're part of this physical world, this physical life. So if you can get in touch with your pure essence, you're not any of those things. So when I'm feeling fear, even if I'm feeling anger, even if I'm feeling dislike, I realize that if I allow it and not suppress it, it passes because it then allows me to get in touch with who I really am at my core. But when I suppress it, anything, anger, dislike, feelings of hurt, if I suppress them thinking, oh, I should be beyond this. You know, those of us who are on this journey, spiritual journey, reading self-help books, we're the toughest on ourselves. We say, oh, we should be beyond this. I should know better than that. And we suppress it. The more we suppress it, the more it adds to the layers that separate us from who we truly are underneath. So I say accept everything. That's how you, you, you're truly authentic, is when you accept everything without judgment. Even what you would judge as bad or negative, just accept it. And when you're able to accept it, you allow yourself to get to your core of who you truly are. That's when you allow yourself to have what I call an inside out view of the world. I speak a lot more about having an inside out view of the world. In fact, I think I spoke about it in both books um, and particularly maybe in, in What If This Is Heaven because we seem to think that the outside world is real and so we react to what's happening on the outside. Whereas I realized from the near-death experience is that my inner world is actually real. I'm being guided all the time, but I don't hear it when I believe the outside world is real. When we believe the outside world is real, we're reacting to the outside world. And if we're reacting, and think about it right now with the news, the mass media, you're reacting to the outside world and you are creating turmoil in your inner world. Now, if you did it the other way around, if you realize that your inner world is real, so have an inside out view, tap into your divinity, tap into your inner guidance first, clear that first, tap into the beauty inside you, your guidance, which is always there, tap into that first. And when you tap into that first, and you, what happens is your outer world then reflects what you feel inside. You can create a better world, a better life for yourself when you tap into your inner world. But instead, what we're doing is we are tapping into the outer world and allowing that to create turmoil in our inner world. What I'd love to do is take some questions from you. So I have a beautiful assistant standing by here, Milena, who's gonna shout out some questions. And feel free to ask me anything, nothing is out of bounds. I'll take as many questions as I can. Tara asks, if everything happens at the same time, does that mean that my soul exists in another dimension, the other side, at the same time as I exist in my human body? Can my soul observe me? Yes, your soul can. I know that's a bit of a mind bender, but I actually believe that because um, when I was in the other realm, I saw all our lives exist, all my lives 
existed simultaneously, as if it was all part of one grand tapestry. Um, and from that realm, it just makes so much sense. But when we try to make sense of it here, because our minds think in linear time, it's very hard to make sense of it. So when we experience what we call past life memories, we're actually seeing past lives that are happening concurrently, but we perceive them as being in the past. And it's also possible for a future you to be guiding a past you or a future you to be guiding a present you. So because it is all happening concurrently. So thanks for that question. Eventually I will write a book that, um, that goes deeper into that. Currently I'm writing a book about, about being a people pleaser and a doormat or yeah, and, and recovering or overcoming from that. Lynette asks, how about a child with cancer? How could they have created that? I'm in the middle of this right now. Oh, first of all, my heart goes out to you. Truly, my heart goes out to you. So I want you to know first that your child did not create it consciously or deliberately. But children are very, very sensitive. And there are many reasons why children get cancer. But I want to uh, say here that have you noticed that it seems that the most sensitive among us are the ones who pick up the most in most diseases because we absorb the feelings and the energies of the people around us. Um, I say this, this is not just applicable to children, so my heart truly goes out to you, um, but this is applicable to any of you who are super sensitive, super empathetic, and those of you who are healers. If you're a healer, you're around people who need healing all the time. And you're a healer probably because you're super sensitive and you can feel the suffering of other people. And those of us who are like that are the most susceptible to absorbing or picking up on the energies around us. So if you are taking care of a child who is going through a challenging time, number one, assure the child all the time that they are loved unconditionally no matter what. If parents are going through something traumatic between them, both parents need to assure the child that they both love the child unconditionally, even if they're not living together. If that's not possible with the other parent, um, the parent who's with the child needs to keep showing this child that they are loved unconditionally. The other thing is the parent who is taking care of the child or parents, they have to make sure that they are uplifted and taking care of themselves and not in fear all the time. The more that you are in fear, the more that you are in turmoil, the more the child is picking up on that energy. So the, so the idea is now don't worry about it, but actually tell yourself, okay, I need to love myself first. I need to be a role model for my child on how to love themselves and take care of themselves. So think in terms not of caretaking, but in terms of being a role model and in terms of loving. You're there to love your child and to be a role model for your child. So love yourself first, take care of yourself first, uplift yourself and then be there for your child. Thank you for that question. Shannon asks, does God have a sense of humor? Oh God, absolutely, yes. God has a sense of humor. God doesn't matter if you call her a her or a him or a it. I mean, you know, you can even call God the geezer in the sky. It, we need to develop sense of humor. It's us who don't have a sense of humor. Um, so yeah, absolutely. We, we need to really not take spirituality so seriously or religion so seriously. Arlette asks, how do we accept? I get what you're saying. I just don't understand how to accept things and just let them be. Can you speak on that? Okay, so it's about accepting things. So you, even if you can't accept something, accept that you can't accept something. And so I'm glad you asked that question because sometimes when we can't accept something or when we feel fear about something, we then feel fear about feeling the fear. We say, oh my God, I'm not supposed to feel fear. Fear causes cancer. I shouldn't feel fear. It causes negativity. It'll, it'll manifest in something bad happening. 
So my point is accept that you feel fear. Accept that you can't accept things. Accept that you can't surrender. Accept that you can't allow, you can't let go. And it's fine. It truly is about even accepting what you can't accept and take it from there. Shamila asks, do we have free will or is everything predetermined? That's a great question. So we come here with a um, intention. We have intentions of what we plan to fulfill. I call that, so our intention um, is what you could call our destiny. And our destiny is basically our highest potential. So we don't necessarily fulfill our destiny, but our destiny is what we intended as our highest potential of what we wanted to attain or be or express when we came here. Now we have free will as to whether to attain our destiny or not. We always have free will as to whether to follow our destiny or not. And so what prevents us from following our destiny? What prevents us is fear and lack of self-love. What keeps us or what, um, what allows us to attain our highest potential or follow our destiny? What allows us is self-love, to really, to really shine our light, be unafraid of failing, to not judge ourselves, to allow ourselves to make mistakes, to never feel that we have to apologize for our existence, to not feel small. These are the kinds of things, if we're unafraid to be who we are, we can, we can truly shine our light and attain our highest potential. And basically our destiny is our highest potential and we have the free will as to whether to attain it or not. One last question? One last question before we sign off. Rose asks, could you please explain from your experience how to approach a cancer patient regarding their illness? How to initiate a conversation on this topic and how to convince them to get so, and then and it, it cuts off. But. Okay, that's a great question. So first of all, I'm gonna start with the last statement was how to convince them. Um, I don't believe in convincing anyone of anything. The only thing you can do is support people and be there for them. Be there for them on their journey, on their terms. So we can't convince them on anything. So the way to approach a cancer patient would be to listen, to be there and say, I'm here for you, and then listen. And if they are the type of person who wants to know more, about um, anything outside of conventional medicine and ways to heal their cancer or who wants to know more about the reasons why they possibly um, could prevent cancer from coming back, if they want to know more about the emotional connection. So first, we have to listen to see if they're open to that. Then it would be something, It's. We have to be careful never to judge the person, never to make the person feel it's their fault they got cancer, because it's never your fault. It's never anybody's fault that they got cancer. Um, I say there's a big difference between taking responsibility and saying it's your fault. If, for example, something happened to you, like as a child, let's say you got raped as a child or something happened to you, it's 100% not your fault. You had no control over that happening and you should never be blamed for it. But if you are still suffering the trauma of it or the after effects of it, it's your responsibility as an adult to get help or to be helped through it. And that's the difference between responsibility and fault. It's your responsibility. Nobody else, it's not anyone else's responsibility to help you. It's your responsibility to get the help you need. So when somebody is seeking help to understand their disease in a different way, then we can be there to really open the doors for them and to show them different ways, to show them the books that have touched you or inspired you. And when somebody wants to be supported a certain way, when they say, I want to be supported in alternative and I only want people who are uplifting, then support them in that way. Uh, I wanna just quickly also share with you my own experience. When I was going through cancer, 
What was happening was there were people who believed in conventional medicine who were telling me that this is the only way to do it. And I was really fearful of conventional medicine. I was fearful of the chemo because I, I really felt they were toxins that, and I didn't want toxins in my body if I was already sick. But I had people telling me, you're crazy. This is the only way to do it. You're gonna kill yourself if you don't do it. Then, so when I did the chemo, um, because of them, I had people on the other side, on the alternative side, who were saying, how can you do that? How can you put the poisons in your body? So in other words, when I was going the alternative way, I had the people on the conventional side telling me I was killing myself, I was crazy. When I was going the conventional way, I had people on the alternative side saying I was crazy, I was putting toxins in my body. So today, I don't tell anybody how they should be doing it. It's a personal journey, but here is one piece of advice that I would tell you, is choose the route that makes you feel empowered. Choose the treatment, the doctor, the team that makes you feel empowered, not disempowered. Choose the one that really makes you feel like you wanna live life again. And if you're dealing with an illness, don't focus on the illness, focus on living life. Focus on your reason for being here. Focus on what you will do when you get healed. Don't focus on the illness or the treatment. Focus on what you're gonna do with the rest of your life when you get healed and get excited about that. So thank you for tuning in. I still love talking to all of you, so tune in for more. Join my Facebook page. And you know what, I'm really excited also to tell you that my uh, website just had a total facelift and it is every color in the rainbow because that's my favorite color. And so check it out, please. And until I see you next time, join me on my Hay House radio show. Take care. Love you all. Thank you for tuning in. Bye.